Welcome back, class. We're going to jump in here for uh, segment number two on the talking about how the providers are using information out of their warehouse. And just with, as we start down through the, the PowerPoint that I've loaded for you out there on the system, they're going to use information out of that warehouse to make clinical decisions and treatment plans. As I said, there's there's, as, as we mentioned before, there's always a potential for asymmetric information. There's always a potential for principal agent issues in the healthcare environment. And providers are trying to, um, I guess, mitigate or minimize these perceptions among the consuming you know, population that they're trying to service on a daily basis. And so they are trying to determine the most effective treatment plan for treating a particular illness that a patient presents, either when they come into the doctor's office, the emergency room, they decide they need to be admitted to the hospital, and providers are constantly trying to improve their decision-making process when it comes to clinical decisions and treatment plans. And, uh, and the information that they're going to use to drive those clinical decisions and treatment plans is going to be extracted from this wealth of data that's stored out there in the provider system. And so it's, it's going to be the um, driving force of the provider's ability to provide the most effective effective or um, the most accurate health plan or treatment plan or clinical decision is going to be based on the ability of the HIMS professional or the um, healthcare informatics professional that is extracting this data from the information warehouse and turning it into act actionable information that they can utilize in their day-to-day -day decision making process. You've also got uh, population health cohorts. Again, I've mentioned, uh, you know, asthma, allergy, um, you know, congestive heart failure, diabetes. Um, and these population health cohorts, if they are managed appropriately, they can go a long way in ensuring that the health status of a consuming population or the health status of the patient is going to uh, have a, uh, it's going to help mitigate the deterioration of that health status over time. And so providers have started, it, it used to be they would send out mailers and I still get mailers, you know, that was with, I, had health care with Anthem for a while. It was just like I was getting mailers every day in the mail. I've switched to, to Aetna this year, and I'm, st I'm still getting mailers in the mail. Talking about, you know, have I done this? You know, have I been going to the gym? Have I been eating properly? Um, they are, you know, constantly trying to ensure that I'm remembering to do everything possible to mitigate the deterioration or the depreciation of my health status over time. They're also talking to me about my annual visit. You know, you know, have you had your annual visit? You know, have you had your blood test? Have you had this? Have you had that? Uh, and they're also they're going to use the provide on the provider side of the house. Not only are they going to use mailers, uh, they're starting to reach out now with text. They're starting to reach out call my email address. And if you're if you have enough of these negative population health cohorts, you may actually be assigned to a case management professional who is typically a nurse. And that nurse is going to try to help you navigate um, the system in such a way that you can um, take better care of yourself and to minimize the impacts of these negative popu population health cohorts. Third thing the provider is going to use the information from the data warehouse is just financial analytics. It's you know it's so we're in uh, we're in March. Most provider 
contracts with with the payer side of the house are going to be negotiated um, probably in in the October November time frame because they want if they're going to have a new contractual rate they want it to go into effect on January the first to start a new county year depends on how the con contractual process works uh, some contracts are are you know what are termed evergreen. And so the contracts just continue to roll over year after year, unless one side or the other decides that they want to cancel the contract. You have some contracts, especially with hospitals, it may be three-year contracts with escalator clauses built into them. Escalator clauses typically tied to the consumer price index. So they may be three-year contracts because negotiating a hospital contracts is, it is a huge lift with just, resources on both the provider side and the payer side. If it's a, uh, a non-hospital contract, you may be negotiating that contract on an annual basis. Uh, there will be changes to the contract simply because there may be changes to the HICPIC codes that we talked about or changes to the CPT codes or changes to the DRGs if it's a hospital. So a lot of activity going on, especially down in the I'll say Q4 of a calendar year when it comes to negotiating contracts. And that's what it's going to drive that negotiation process of these financial analytics. And they're going to be driving or extracting that information out of the information warehouse. Also, you're going to have financial analytics that are going to have to be submitted to, you know, state, federal, local governments. Financial analytics that are going to have to go to the associations, American Medical Association, American Hospital Association. You may have some that are going not to nonprofit agencies that are, are doing research. You may be sending some to public health associations. So a lot of financial information is being extracted uh, and that financial information is being is being utilized to make the financial decisions and the financial determinations that are going to drive the profitability of that provider so or that provider organization. There have been over the last few years several provider organizations that um, have decided that they can't make any money, you know, treating Medicare patients, so they're not going to treat Medicare patients anymore. Maybe they can't make money treating Medicaid patients. So they may go to focus their entire practice on either commercial patients or private pay patients. Financial analysis drives a tremendous amount of activity within the provider environment. You've got operational efficiency. Um, provider organizations are constantly looking at the marginal product of labor looking at their average product of labor, looking at how many patients they can see an hour, looking at what the wait time is in the emergency room, uh, looking at what the, you know, how, how long it takes to turn around lab results or how long it takes to turn around radiology results. It, there's just, there are a lot of operational metrics that are driving um, the operational efficiency decisions within any given provider organization. And again, may not be coming from the same um, partition in the information warehouse as population cohorts or financial analytics, but that data is still being stored in that, in that system, in that provider system and more than likely is being stored in a segment in that information warehouse. You've got regulatory and compliance reporting. Again, it goes back to, um, you know, association reporting. It goes back to CMS reporting, you know, to, and also to state and local type compliance and reporting activities. And all of that information is going to be driven right out of that information warehouse. It's going to be stored there and it's going to be extracted there. And you hope that you have a system that is efficient in extracting that information, populating the reports, so that the efficiency of the process of, of extracting that information, generating that those reports is efficient as possible. Because at that point, if you are efficient on the reporting side, you can take and, and reallocate or repurpose 
those analytical resources to doing something else. You're going to use the information in, in the information warehouse, as, as we talked about, to do research and evidence-based medical decisions, um, quality improvement strategies. Providers are constantly trying to improve the quality of the healthcare goods and services that they provide to their covered members that, that come to see them for healthcare goods and services, come to see them to um, hopefully uh, receive some relief from the, the health issues that they have. So uh, information in that information warehouse is being extracted. And again, on quality type improvement strategies, um, the information is going to be more quality based than it is kind of financial or maybe unit based. But um, it's extremely important when it comes to improving the efficacy of the treatment regimes and also to the quality of care, or at least the perception in the patient's eyes of the quality of care that they receive when they go to either a doctor's office or a hospital for healthcare goods and services. You're also going to use it for patient century, uh, patient centric enablement. It, it is becoming more and more evidence when you when you go to the doctor's office. A lot of the, um, I guess, the pre-admission type of services or pre-admission type of information, whether it's going into the hospital or whether it's going into your doctor's office, is being taken care of via the internet. Via, you know, you go on, get on the internet, you get in their system, you type in your ID and your password, and you're off and running. They're asking you questions, you're filling out information, and it's for especially... Uh, a younger population, and they they love that approach to health to seeking healthcare goods and services. These systems now have chat functions. They've got you know email back and forth. You could you know shoot a question to your provider and may not get back to you on the chat you know quickly, but um, usually they'll try to answer them at least at the end of the day if they can. So there is just a lot of virtual interaction back and forth between patients and providers, more so than there's ever been. Um, especially if we've talked about it, you know, e-health, d-health, you know, digital health, um, just a lot of information transfer back and forth between the providers and the patients. Um, and just telemedicine, you know, teledoc, uh, it is increasing the accessibility to healthcare goods and services for a lot of individuals in the United States today. When we want to talk about the functions of a healthcare data warehouse, especially from the provider side of the, the financial coin, we're talking about data integration. It, you know, you're going to have similar to on the payer side. If you're looking at it on the provider side, you're going to have a single authoritative source of information. Providers can get in there, individuals working in a provider's office, you know, analytics, you know, analytic type individuals at the provider's office at the hospital level. Um, maybe even if you think about, you know, think about Nashville and HCA, you've got a, a group of people in that information data warehouse constantly trying to sort that information in such a way that they can provide it to the decision makers that will enable them that will enable them to make um, accountable decisions, financially driven, informationally driven decisions that are going to better the organization. Functions of that data warehouse, and we've talked about it. You're going to have analytics and, and reporting functions, uh, trending information, forecasting information, predicting information. Um, let's say a let's say you in a doctor's office and you're sitting there at lunch and you know the the represent drug representative from Pfizer knocks at the door and he comes in he's pushing this you know new miracle drug maybe it's a cancer drug or it's a dementia you know mitigating drug and he's pushing this drug and he's talking about here's what the trend's going to be in the next year next two years next five years he's forecasting profits if you will um prescribe this drug. He's also trying to predict uh, the 
hopefully positive impact on your covered population by using this drug. And so you are you are using this information. You are trying to, as a provider, especially as the analyst of a provider organization, you're trying to use this information, talking about new drugs, new treatment modalities, and trying to determine how healthcare is going to trend if you start using these new uh, advances in medicine in your particular doctor's office. You know, what's it going to do with the number of office visits that you can drive? What's it going to do with the number of times your patients will access your office? You're also going to use it to predict you know, how you want to develop your negotiating strategy when it comes to the payer side of the house. So analytics and reporting um, are going to be driven not only now, but significantly in the future with, them, with data coming out of this data warehouse. You've got data security. Again, we've talked about this on multiple occasions, privacy, compliance, multifaceted security, Again, on the provider side, just, you know, anecdotally to me, just seems like you've got a lot more people accessing this information on the provider side than you may have on the payer side. And you've got to be especially concerned at this day and age with hackers, with data breaches, with information um, going to unauthorized users. So, you're, you know, data security is a significant driver when it comes to information warehouse on the provider side. You've got decision support tools, business informatics, healthcare informatics, HIMS professionals, creating dashboards, and you know, it's, you know, they're trying to simplify the decision making process. Majority of these information warehouses have a dashboard that you can configure and set on top of them, and they may be like a speedometer where you know it it goes red, yellow, green. Maybe like a stoplight that goes, you know, goes red, yellow, green. And so, you know, if you're in an area on the dashboard where you shouldn't be, either from an operational perspective or a financial perspective or even a quality perspective, you know, you don't want to be down here in the red zone. You, you don't really want to be in the yellow zone, but the yellow is better than the red. You want to be up here in this green zone, especially when it comes to customer satisfaction. You will be sitting up here in this green zone. On your warehouse, you want it to be scalable and flexible. You know, scalable and you know have the adaptability to changes. Healthcare is constantly changing, and it's going to continue to change at a faster pace, especially with the advent of artificial intelligence and machine learning. Just you can just you can just see the potential for changes. They're going to be exponential in healthcare. And you've got to have a, way, a warehouse that is scalable and flexible so that you can function within uh, this particular uh, changes in the healthcare environment. You want to be able to leverage industry standards, you know, you know taking care of, of HIPAA-based information. Um, you want to be able to get in and play in the e-health uh, environment. You want to be able to function in that digital health or that de-health environment because that's going to improve the ability to transfer information, patient-based information, from one location to the other or to spread that information or access to that information across a continuum within a, within a healthcare system. It's also going to provide you know, patient empowerment, patient enablement, patient-centric access to information. So you want to be able to leverage your industry standards. You also want to have the ability to archive data. You're always going to be involved in audits. You know, you may want to have uh, some data geeks that are wanting to do time series analysis. So you want to be able to archive it so that you can look at time series data across timelines or time frames. You want to be able to look at patient histories. Again, patient histories go, the ability to access patient histories go to driving those, the efficacy of those treatment plans and the uh, treatment cohorts that you're going to suggest to your patients when they come to see you at the office. 
And then again, lastly, on the functions of the data warehouse, you're talking about patient centric transparency, mitigation of asymmetric information, um, reduction or mitigation of at least the perception of the agent principal issues that uh, have uh, tended to spring up over time, especially in uh, this, this healthcare environment. And again, I think it's mostly driven by asymmetric information, but there is a perception out there that uh, patients are becoming more and more reluctant to just accept, I mean, it used to, you'd go in the doctor's office and they'd say, here's what we're going to do. We're going to do this, this, and this. And it was like, oh, okay, that works for me. Yeah, thanks, doc. And you'd get up and leave. But now patients are constantly questioning. I mean, I actually feel sorry for the doctor when my wife goes into scene because I mean, she, she grills him and she knows, she understands when it comes to healthcare, she probably understands more than a lot of, of physicians do. And, you know, she is, she, is con she is constantly questioning everything that that physician is telling her. And, and I think because of her, her ability to do that, she comes out with a much more well-rounded treatment plan than I probably do. If, if, if they say something sounds weird to me, I'll question it, but I'm not going to question everything they say. And with that, we're going to um, stop for a few minutes. And when we come back, we're going to kind of wrap this up on uh, what's considered um, the, the benefits of uh, a data warehouse on the provider side of that financial call. Talk to everybody in a few minutes.